are you all doing marvelously well? Hey. All right, so who should we bring up next? Look, Mr. Reed Shippen, everybody. Big round of applause for Mr. Reed Shippen. He's here to make me look really stupid. <laughs> All right, next, where is Kim Rosen? Mastering engineer extraordinaire. Where's Ryan Hewitt hiding out? Oh, he's over there. How should we describe you? Producer, engineer, mixer, extraordinaire. Which I believe is also Reed. I didn't give you that one. Two consecutive country number ones. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry, Jeff, I didn't see you there, but last but no means least. Jeff has 47 consecutive country number ones. <laughs> he has his own genre. It's country, hip-hop, Zydeco. Yeah. <laughs> I have a polka record. A polka record. Marvellous. So let's all, uh, wherever you'd like. All right. Was he good? I didn't see him that much. <laughs> so it's a shame it's so cold today. So what's the deal? Like Vintage King can't afford air conditioning outside? Well, they've got this big thing here, and I said, can we do it standing in front of this huge <laughs> fan over here? Which I think would have been rather lovely. Chevy, can we pick that up and just direct it this way? It's a signal to noise problem. Oh, okay. So I was thinking of a... The great thing about being here is I've been here all week. I did uh, three days at Blackbird doing some teaching stuff. I, we, there was a great party at Vance Pounds last night, which I saw all of you, I believe. Mm -hmm. Didn't see you. Oh, yeah, you bailed. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to interview Ryan, and Reed came over and spoke to a bunch of guys at Blackbird. It was really amazing. So I sp it gave me a week to sort of think about what we should talk about. There's two very obvious things, I think, out of being out here. And one of them I think we should cover, just because we're all very aware of the sort of exodus of people that have been moving to Nashville recently. So I want to sort of talk about, like, like you know, Ryan, what's your experience of coming out here? The L.A. diaspora. <laughs> but then also, you know, Kim works remotely in New Jersey. So that reality... But then the other thing I also want to talk about, seeing as we're sitting in Vintage King and we're surrounded by beautiful equipment, is more about recording. Because, you know, talking with Ryan, talking with Reed, when they're both mixing tons of stuff, and then Kim obviously, um, you know, mastering, I don't know what your experience so much is, Jeff, but I'm sure it's pretty similar where we're going, is that these days, everybody is, all they're focusing on is mixing. I go and open up the wonderful world of YouTube and there's 25 million videos on how to mix a kick drum. You know, and it's great, and it's wonderful, but when you work with guys and girls of this caliber, you don't really have to do that much in a mix. You're trying to, you know, I always thought mixing was kind of like bringing out more of what was already there. But when I talk to you, it seems like a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time you're sort of recapturing, recreating, fixing puzzles and pieces. So there's less production and recording maybe going on that we used to see maybe in days of old, whatever that might be, like 10 years ago. So, Ryan, I'm going to throw you under the bus because you kind of started me thinking about this. Um, Where should we start? Well... What intrigued me is when you and I were talking, is it's not just from, you know, because we want to say, oh, yeah, it's just some kids, they have no idea what they're doing. I think now it's sort of becoming almost an excuse where a lot of people are getting a little slapdash about stuff. And I get the idea of creativity, that you want to move fast, you want to capture ideas. Um, but I do feel like now that we have a proliferation of plugins and millions and millions of tracks, that we're losing a little bit of focus. Uh, yeah, I mean, as, and as we were discussing the other day, it runs the gamut from, you know, the person recording a, 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 a record in their bedroom to a superstar songwriter who doesn't know how to record stuff. Um, and I see a proliferation of people who, because they have a Pro Tools rig and a microphone and a preamp, they're calling themselves engineers. And that's sort of, um, I mean, that's like calling yourself a chef when you have a microwave, you know. It's, <laughs> you're, you're making food to eat, but it's not at the same level as, you know, Anthony Bourdain was at, for example. Um, 
And so, you know, we get to mix these things from indie records that are made in bedrooms that are awesome, but maybe not great sounding, to, like I said, this aforementioned superstar songwriter who's got a 47 and a 1073 in a, in a big room in somewhere in, not in this country, um, that sounds like dog shit. And it's presented to me as if it's like the greatest thing in the world. And I said to the guy, like, can you please fix these edits? for starters, and then I can maybe listen to this, because it's crack, pop, 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 crack, 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 No crossfades on 130 tracks where there's, you know, between eight and 30 edits per bar. Thank God for Isotope. Well, he didn't consolidate them, so my poor assistant spent three days fixing each song to make it playable. Um, and he just says to me in a note, I don't really know what this record's supposed to sound like. That's your job. And I said, well, no, you're the producer. That's your job to make something that sounds like something. So it took me three days to mix that song. Um, but anyway, it's nothing new. Uh, I was getting stuff 15 years ago that was you know, distorted to oblivion through a, you know, a 001, for example. And so uh, it's, just, it's gotten more and more and more. And people, like you say, are not paying attention to capturing things correctly. They're like, oh, well, we'll just use Sound Replacer or Trigger to put new drum sounds on this shitty drum set that I'm going to play, even though I'm a guitar player. You know, so I'm going to edit this stuff and be detective and, and so on and so on. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it just makes the job harder for us to make a great sounding record. Um, so let's make some tutorials on recording shit. Well, you know, it bears mentioning that this is a rookie mistake that I totally fell into also. I figured, you know what, if I had all the good gear, I'd be a good engineer. Yeah. It's kind of the same as like, well, if I had the same keyboard as you know this great keyboard player i'll be a great keyboard player and it took me a while to figure out that no i can screw up vocals with a 47 and a 1073 i mean it's harder right but you know i mean that that i don't want to hear you sing well no you, you don't want to hear me sing you've heard me sing um you just don't know it uh the uh, um the, the temptation is to go read Gear Sluts and the Sweetwater catalog and, like, buy all this shiny, crazy shit and not spend time with the stuff that you've got on hand working to make that as good as it can and forgetting that, like, every Michael McDonald vocal you've ever heard has been on pretty much an SM57 and every Michael Jackson vocal you've ever heard has been on an SM7. So they didn't need to spend $15,000 on a vocal mic maybe we should start there. But I, th I thought, you know, if you buy the best stuff, you're going to have the best sounds, and that's just not true. It's ears, not gears. Ears, not gears. It's, the, it's, it's not the arrow, it's the Indian. You know, uh, I think it even, I, the stuff I get even goes one notch deeper this last year, where it, they'll send you stuff and they'll go, you know, make a record. This, this is as far as we could get it. And a lot of times I find myself hiring somebody to overdub whether it's guitars, drums, whatever, because it, what they have doesn't, is not going to reach where I know they want to go with the song. So you end up basically co-producing the song to the level it needs to be and then mixing it. Which is, f we shouldn't complain about because the reason why no, they're it's coming great. to you is because they know that you're going to pull that off. Right. I mean, it's, it's not really a complaint. It's just a trend. <laughs> That's what I'm that's, seeing. But that's, if, if they give you a budget and leeway to do that, that's fantastic. Like, some of the records I have, they're like, if, if uh, there was a record I did a while back where the dude played everything, I put a shaker on it, and I sent him the mix because I felt it needed a shaker, you know? And he's like, and he, li without even a comment, just sent me his own shaker track. <laughs> he's like, I have to play everything. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> At least he was on board, you know? Kim, are you finding that you're educating people they're sending you something I think always and I think one of the things that I've experienced is that everything in engineering is kind of cyclical so you, you get people that you work with either on a repeat basis or a few times and you have those kind of growing pains where things are kind of messed up and and they're learning and you're helping more than just doing your engineering or your work and then you kind of through time and working together on various projects they kind of get smarter and get hipper and and kind of know what they're doing, but as soon as they've flown the coop, you know, gone off and, and done better work, you have a whole new set of people coming in with the same issues and the same, you know, problems and overcompressed mixes and sibilance and stuff. So I think 
we need to get into a solution because I don't want us to be like the. You know, back in my day, we used to take the 50... No, I mean, and I, I think in some... What we used to have, and probably still do on certain records, is you had the big Rick rubin kind of overseer guy, and then you had the Jim Scott, you know, and then you had an arranger. You know what I mean? You had, like, 15 people doing 15 different very highly skilled jobs. Um, now, increasingly, it's us. You know, you are the producer, engineer, mixer, co-writer, musician whatever so it it seems to me the education i think is definitely in the musicality i found that when i'm talking to people they're always talking about things that are technical and they it sort of starts to become esoteric really really quickly and i don't think it's esoteric for me i think it's me and this is just my opinion you can totally disagree like i just feel like if i put on a beach boys record i hear oh yeah he recorded a bass guitar and then there's a piano about here with the low mids and then there's a harpsichord there and then there's some high mids of an acoustic and a glockenspiel and then a vocal over the whole thing it's like every instrument was chosen arrangement wise and sonically to fit into place i think he did that naturally he had that talent and it just happened because some people some people send me stuff and they have no business being good engineers and they're phenomenal and some people send me stuff and they they have every business being great engineers and the tracks aren't great including some of my own i screw myself you know tracking all the time it's actually kind of fun to paint yourself right. into a corner but yeah. um Painful. you know like some people just understand that inherently and i think brian wilson is actually the perfect example of someone who understood inherently like where everything needed to go. If you listen to the Pet Sounds box set, you can hear him arranging people in the room around a microphone until the blend is correct. Yeah. I, I mean, I think he was, he was a weirdo. He was a genius. You know, that's, that's where that came from. I think we should, the solution we, to some of your pain points you're talking about in this is, I mean, it's obviously education, and it's, it's focusing yeah. on recording. And I think if, if someone that doesn't realize what it takes to really sculpt something into a record... Because really, if you start from the beginning when you record it and sculpt it to the song, to the artist, to the vibe, to everything, then you're, you're another level higher by the mix, obviously. Well, and then realizing that arrangement, you talk about arrangement, that makes me think, you know, even, even guitars, I mean, if you leave them flat and f wait and figure out what inversion, where to lay that around the vocal, the melody, and everything else, you probably won't have to touch it if you've got a great guitar player with a great sound. I mean, it's that simple. It, it really, first place you go before you touch anything is arrangement, I think. Well, one of the biggest advantages to what Warren's been doing with Produced by a Pro is that you're actually getting advice from people who make records because one of the things that I've noticed online on Gear Sluts, on YouTube, is there's a whole lot of people giving advice about how to make records and they don't actually make records. And they have no idea how to make records. So why would you want to take advice from someone? I mean, do you want to take advice from someone about driving who doesn't have a driver's license? That's strange to me. But it happens all the time. Yeah, it does happen all the time. Uh, I think, and the reason why I think everybody focuses on mixing is because... Sexy. You, yeah, and it's easy. I mean, I don't want to be... Any, anyone with a pair of yeah, computers... It's simple. I mean, it only no, it's not simple to mix with right? some, but it's simple to make a tutorial. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can go... It, all of us know, I mean, like, take a kick drum, like, boost 60 hertz pull out the low mids somewhere between 250 and 400, you know. If you but want metal, boost 7K. And that's about. actually one of, the, the, one of the keys. If, if someone says, here's your starting EQ points on a kick drum, ignore everything that person yeah. says for the rest of your natural life. Yeah. <laughs> that's good advice because they don't know what they're doing because anybody who's actually done this for a living knows that there is no starting EQ point on a kick drum. Except for my preset on the SSL plug. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. Is that the RH10? That's the RH10, isn't it? Yeah, it's the, the, the RH4K. Yeah. I know, and we talk about education. So, you know, you can, you can learn technical aspects of engineering, but a lot of why people are talented and successful comes from their intuition, their experience, and those are things that you cannot teach. So if you work with somebody and you mentor somebody or you've, I mean, that's where so much more comes from it. I mean, people will go on to Gear Sluts or read online, like how to do this, how to do that, uh, what not to do. Telling someone what to do is just as valuable telling someone what not to do. But I mean, really making mistakes, I mean, we can say we need to educate, but a lot of times it's just, sometimes people just, ha it's like you said, Reed, sometimes people just have an, a, a, a talent where they might not, they, they shouldn't even. But that intuition, 
Um, I think a lot of times we might think that things are really well planned out and laid out and specific and they were very intentional with their choices, but really sometimes people just have great intuition with do choices that they make. Do we think, in, can I ask you individually, do you, do you have an aha moment? For me it was like I was, I don't know, maybe 21. I had a studio with, uh, with some friends and we had a MSR 20, 24, you remember those one inch tape machines and a soundtracks console. And uh, Andy Jackson came in, who was, is, still is, Pink Floyd's like engineer and producer, and I'm like super nervous. And he comes in and he sets up four mics on a drum kit, and he had a you know, D12, 57, pair of 87s, and of course it was the best drum sound I'd ever heard at that point in my life, and I didn't touch anything on the console. I, like, I didn't, we, we didn't have cell phones in those days, I'm old. But you know, I tried to remember every position of every mic, you know, I didn't touch the compressor or the gain going into it, which of course is all meaningless because the next drummer played completely differently. But I do remember going, that sounds good and I can identify it sounds good. And it, it, it's that kind of stuff for me is like, I, I couldn't hear compression easily for two years. I mean, I could hear when it was terrible and I can hear when it was good, but I didn't understand for a couple of years. I honestly didn't. I was like, release, attack, I mean, it, I'm sure there are geniuses, but I'm certainly not one. I just I think that's a huge component of, of having talent or intuition or knowing what you're doing is knowing what you're hearing. Right. And if you don't, I mean, you can follow instructions. Someone can give you a full layout of how they mix or how they master or what they do. And you can follow those steps and try to do it. And it doesn't sound the same because you're not using your ears and feeling the music or following what needs to be done. You're like, you're, you're not making that connection. And how do you teach someone how to critically listen? I mean, have you ever try to explain that? I mean, through your years, your, your years of listening to stuff, yeah. well, how actually, did you get there? I, I still don't understand compression. Um, <laughs> I, know when it sounds good. I, I do. I know, I know when it sounds good. I, I think I know when it sounds good. I just mess with it until it sounds good. If you ask me what settings, I, I haven't the foggiest idea. Uh, critical listening. You know what, my aha moment, one of my aha moments was going and doing a couple seasons at Aspen Music Festival and doing full-on hardcore classical music recording. And it teaches you ear training in a way that working in a studio doesn't. Like there's so many variables and so many different things and two mics or four mics or six mics and, and it, it really taught me how to listen critically that translated really well back to doing the pop stuff. So that was, that was I think, a big benefit. I think that listening a lot anywhere is the best way to learn how to critically listen. And people just, I don't know, won't take the time or, or will jump right in and, and try to get to work, so to speak, instead of just listening to music they love. Listen in your car, listen on your headphones, listen to speakers. But I mean, that was the, the hardest part for me. An aha moment for me was listening to a song I had heard a million times. And I was, I was apprenticing and training to be a mastering engineer, but all of a sudden I realized like, what's that sound on the snare? Oh, that's, that's reverb. That's, you know, I've listened to this song for, you know, six years and I'm just noticing this now and I was like wow what else am I not had I not noticed in the past and then that opened kind of the floodgates to to really figuring out what you're hearing and is important I feel like I have aha moments every day because I feel like I'm pretty dumb um, but I mean like for one of them is I my only regret in life really was not taking piano lessons when I was a kid and I said this to a class or, or to my room full of Blackbird students, and one of them called me the next day and says, I'll give you piano lessons and if, if you let me hang out in the studio. So I said, great. And I started taking piano lessons with him, and then he got a gig somewhere else and left. And then I pursued it with another teacher in town who's wonderful. And, you know, it's like years and years of mixing and recording and being around music since I was a kid. You know, I'd, I'd had a basic rudimentary understanding of theory, but then I started learning chords and inversions and, you know, keys and scales and all this other stuff. And my teacher was showing me this song, like a Beatles song that I've listened to since I was in grade school. And I was like, holy shit, that's what they're talking. I was like, oh, oh, now I like know what's actually happening. And then the other day I was working out in the gym and there was a song I've been listening to since fourth grade that was on the radio. And I was like, I never noticed the bass line and the bridge of that song. And, it's, and you, you talk about like critical listening. There's these things that you sort of take for granted. You skim over these things. You're, you're not fully concentrated listening to all the details at all the time, because you can't. So you'll pick up things incrementally over the years and years and years. And just one other anecdote with watching someone else have an aha moment 
was um, when I was doing a Chili Peppers record, I walked into John Frusciante's house and I hear this CD skipping back and forth and back and forth playing two bars of music from a, um, a uh, who's married to Jay-Z, what's her name? Uh, Beyonce record. And he kept going over and over and over these two bars. Sexist. And I, uh, sorry, I couldn't remember her name. And I, and I walk into his living room and there he is on the floor just totally blissed out with the remote in his hand. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I can't hear all the harmonies at the same time that are happening in this part of the song. And I really want to know how she's stacking these so we can do this later today. And then we stacked like eight part harmonies on something. And I, and I went back and got the record and listened to it. I'm like, oh, you can't listen to all that. It's just this one big massive sound. And then you have to dissect each little thing individually and, and, and or write it down to find out what's going on. He, he came to me on pre-production. I was doing pre-production with him in, and it was Californication when he first came back in. He came to me with a cassette of a live Teardrop Explode show that he had recorded as a kid. And when it played back, it was like... It was like warbling all over the place. And he wanted me to load it into Pro Tools and correct the pitch and timing so he could listen to it. I thought that was pretty insane, but now that's the next level. He's definitely that guy, isn't he? It's amazing. If, if there's alien life, he's one of them. <laughs> And I have to say, I'm with you. I have aha moments all the time and always want to go, man, can I go back and redo that once you have them? Uh, a big one was last year. I was doing some work with the Eagles, and I had some tracks of their earlier albums. And you, you pull it up, and you just sit there and go, oh. even, even some early Glenn John stuff, and you just pull up a, you know, a two-track of drums or you pull up a guitar sound, and it just makes you go, okay, I'm an idiot. <laughs> You know, it's like, wow. And I, I think those are great. I think if you don't have them all the time, you, you kind of stop learning. And I think those moments are good. They keep you, they keep you chasing it and keep you, keep you moving forward and striving for stuff. And realize that you're over-striving sometimes. Sometimes it's a matter of a, of a good mic chain, of a, of a clean preamp. And one other thing I wanted to mention from earlier was the other thing, I think the, the biggest pet peeve I have about getting stuff is people don't realize what the I.O. is aligned to. And they don't realize that minus 18 doesn't allow you to run it through a piece of tube gear and get full bandwidth, you know, a full waveform out of it, that, that you're overdriving the crap out of the tubes. And if, the, if they can realize gain structure, that's a huge part of it in a clean path. And then they have to have that ability to know what sounds good, know if it's muffled or whatever to back off, come at it. But a 57 and a clean preamp can get you a long way, you know? What's the difference between good, good enough, and perfect? You know, and you want good, and hopefully you want great. Good enough is a little scary, especially now, because it's like, ah, that's good enough, they can fix it. Mm -hmm. And perfect is scary, too, because then you, you can work on, like your guy who had to play everything, you can work on getting it perfect, and it sucks. It doesn't feel good, but it's perfect. It's technically perfect, but it just doesn't feel like music. So, you know, you go back and listen to that Stevie Wonder stuff, and yeah, there's distortions, there's missed hits, there's bad notes, there's all that stuff. Do you even notice? No. You don't notice at all. You know, I, uh, thinking about all this, uh, this all goes back to my mind, because crediting is kind of a big deal, right? Right now, so it's starting to come back, finally, and there's a lot of good initiatives pushing that, but that's how you know who to look for. You hear something great, then you look for the name, and you realize who played or who engineered or who produced it, and you go find other records they've done, and maybe credits will bring that into focus a little more, because I think if people can get inspired and study those things, because it's hard to find something now. You can Google something to death and never find out who played on it or engineered it. There's a lot of work going on to correct that situation. Yeah. I, I feel that in the next probably in the next year we're going to have some credit solutions that'll stick. Yeah, we've, we've got some good ones coming up. In the back of my mind, I keep thinking to myself, it's all about performance. Now, I know that sounds really obvious, but when you talked about the Eagles, I thought about they were probably singing a lot of those harmonies at the same time around the Early mic. stuff they did, yeah. And it's, so it's not just about I'm not even thinking about the studio. The fact is they probably played those songs live or at least in a rehearsal room hundreds of times before they got into the studio. So they, and when you were talking about the tape the other day, we were talking about that idea that 
it's not about the sonics of the tape. It's about the psychology of tape that you came back into the control room and you listened and went, oh, I need to lay back. And you didn't question the drummer. You thought, well, he's pushing into the downbeat of the chorus. Of course he is. He wants to make it more exciting. Rah! Or you said, you know what? That feels fine. I bet you I can get it better. But if I can't get it better, I'm going to lose what I got. So in the grand scheme of things, how does it feel? Just how does it feel? And it sure as hell wasn't. Let's zoom in and see if it's on the grid. <laughs> I don't know. You didn't use calipers? On analog tape? I did. No. <laughs> did you really? Oh, my gosh. It was a nightmare. Yeah, I, had a, I made a chart so you could, you could offset the sequencer, measure the kick and bass. Every time they'd sequence something, I'd have to measure it to see, figure out an offset. Please Every kill me. sample was different. Wow. I don't miss that. Grease proof. Uh, grease. What do you call pencil? Grease pencil. Yeah, we call them China graphs. Well, so. but you know what? That yielded some of the great Steely Dan stuff, where they were literally oh, yeah. spending weeks and weeks and weeks delaying individual drum hits with delays and fixing every single thing until it was exactly perfect or what they wanted it. And some of those records are just, they sound brilliant. I have that a theory which you can all disagree with, okay, with, uh, with about Mutt Lang. <laughs> you know, that Mutt, Mutt made some of the best sounding records when you could only be so perfect it's almost like what you're talking about. You can delay things so they sound right. Now you can delay things so they sound perfect. There's a whole different mentality. I, I did a couple of years on X Factor, so we did lots of covers of songs. And one of them was we did a cover of Back in Black. And I always just thought Back in Black was like, you know, it's Mark Lang, it's on the grid, it's absolutely perfect. And there's no click, it's like this. It's all over the place, but has anybody ever driven to ACDC and not ended up at 100 miles an hour and thought that it was not... I just assumed it was on a grid. That's what makes shit exciting. It's like the yeah. imperfections make things classic and, and exciting. I mean, like the, uh, going back to the Chili Peppers record I did, there, we did 36 songs. One of them had a click. But if you told Chad, slow down one BPM in the chorus, he would nail it every fucking time. And we'd cut between, we, it was all on tape, we'd cut between this take and that take and the other one for like verse, chorus. Sometimes we'd copy a chorus and fly it in again. But it, it makes things way more exciting. And then it's not this like awesome jam to like, oh shit, the click on this thing, you know? And, and it just became this sort of wonder of its, of its own. So what's happening to us then? Because we hear that, that record sold a gazillion and a half record, billion records. And... You know, Chris Stapleton, all these records that we absolutely love that go off and are number one albums worldwide. And we all know that they're made that way, but we're not making records on it's, the whole. It's hard like for that. people to get up, give up control. Like when you yeah. have a click, the producer or the engineer is in control of the song, and everyone's playing to what you feed them. And then you can be lazy and edit that stuff later. And I've tried to explain to bands, like, just because we're not on a click doesn't mean we can't edit. You know, there's, there's songs that have been edited in the, in the, the vast canon of music that changed tempo blatantly on a dime. You don't notice because it's a good edit and a good band, and it doesn't matter. Now, I will say that I, d I don't think you can def define a great record by that, or a, a multi-platinum selling record. I mean, I worked on Come On Over for Shania. We cu I cut that with Mutt. And you talk about, I mean, he tightened the click. <laughs> I'll just say that. It was an MPC click. He went back and tightened the click. And we, I mean, we worked as a day of song. And it was so tight by the end of the day, I couldn't imagine tightening it. And he did. You know, but as it got tighter, there was, there was all this space that appeared. And there was something that happened. And he had a vision with the songs, the arrangement, and everything that made it work. I mean, that sold 40 million copies or something silly. So I, I, I don't think it's the defining point of a, of a great sure. selling record. But I think whatever you do, you have to realize that you, you got to bring the listener into an experience and they have to enjoy that experience Absolutely. and be into it. Kim, you were going to say something? Yeah, I think it, part of what engineering is, is refining your ability as an engineer, or my ability as an engineer, to present an artist, a band in the best way, but that great performers, great songs, great performances on a, on a recording that can drive any type of engineering approach. So you can have an approach or, or pay a lot of attention to, to some aspect of it, but if you have an amazing artist who's written a fantastic song, uh, it, it will just drive itself out there. So as engineers, we 
try out these things, we, we, we focus on these things, we, we find them important, but I think that's just like an exploration of, of our artistry as engineers to complement what is already amazing, which is a great artist and a great yeah, song. We should probably mention privilege. Because back in the day, you had to be kind of a badass to be in a studio. Um, we're really lucky because we get to work with people like Chad Smith or Matt Chamberlain. These guys are incredible players. Most people making records now, and it's a majority of people who are actually making music, because there's a lot more music being made, don't have that privilege. So if you're measuring yourself against Chad Smith, good luck, right? I mean, it's just not going to happen. If you're measuring yourself against Brian, William, uh, Brian um, Wilson or uh, Paul McCartney, good luck. I mean, listen to the vocal on El Eleanor Rigby. That was a pass. It's perfect. Everything about it is perfect. He's the only guy that can do that, period. So if you're working in you know, Poughkeepsie on some local band and you're expecting to hit that level, it's just not going to happen. Sure. I think to, to really bring that home, when we talk about you know, bands, Chili Peppers, Eagles... Beatles, Beach Boys. Well, not only my favorite band's Queen, as anybody who follows me know, every, all these bands have multiple songwriters. And nowadays, if you can sing and you can write a song, you have your own band. Or even if you can't sing. <laughs> Which is fine. You know, I mean, there's really cool music out there made by people who can't sing. But they're still making cool music, which is one of the bad things and the amazing things about the current technology that we have. But I'm sort of I'm feeling in my mind that we're, we're all circling around this thing, that all the great records that we love, whether they're recent or not, are massive collaborations. The collaboration of a really talented singer with a bunch of incredible musicians, great engineers, great mixers, great everything, arrangers, string arrangers. That's a well, pretty direct, you know, yeah, it's a, and realizing it's a process. Mm -hmm. I mean, people just don't... Sometimes it's like back in black where they go out and they nail it, do an overdub, and they're done, they're talking the rest of the time. Uh, but very rarely. Most of the time it's a process of building it and going, you know what, that needs to come off, that needs to be redone, that. And you, you just build until you know you hit the bar. And that's the thing, knowing where the bar is so you know when you get there. And, and just to add to that, like, I, f I find that a lot of the, the most difficult mixes I have are the ones with the, the worst rough mixes because they weren't listening to what they had and they kept adding shit and adding shit and adding shit and not paying attention to how it covered up everything else. Then they put samples on the drums because now everything's obscuring that. And then they put 20 background vocals because they're obs that's been obscured by the guitars and so on and so forth. And it's like, if you pay attention to how everything sounds as you put it down. And like, okay, hey, let me put that back in the mix and see how that feels and how that affects everything that we've got before moving on to the next thing that you must have on your record because you saw it somewhere else. Then you'll make a better record. And, and what I wind up doing as a mixer is putting mute all over things until I can hear the song. And then maybe I can add it back in or not, depending on what's happening. And some people get upset, like you've erased my you got rid of my favorite guitar part. And it's like, well, it, it wasn't necessary. It's cool, but we don't need 17 melodies happening in the chorus. And then they put it back in anyway. <laughs> well, if they, hire, if they fire me, then, you know, that's, you know, whatever. Uh, how long we got? Where's Chevy? Right here. Um, you know, we've got, we've got 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So let's do a little bit of a... Well, you know what, can I just wrap this up? Do you, would you agree with this kind of statement that two things? Listen to a lot of great music to understand production, and also collaborate. I think even if you're in Wisconsin, you know, find, and you're in a little village, find musicians, find other people to collaborate with. Because I feel like we're all playing instruments. I'm sure everybody here plays an instrument really, really well. But isn't it just so much more fun when you hire an incredible bass player, even if they're only going to play eighth notes? It doesn't matter. Just it's having that perspective. But having, having a relationship with everybody that you work with. I mean, the, like the mastering engineers I work with, every time I send them, I'm like, what did I do wrong? What right, can I yeah. do better next time? Even if it's like they say there's nothing, everything's perfect, I just added a little low end, a little top end. It's still, at this point in my career, I'm like, what can I do better? Like, if there was something you could tell me in this record that's, that I could do better, like unmasking a certain frequency or panning things or, or the way I used reverb on it, what can, I, what can I do better next time? Is there anything I can do better with a recall and send it back to you? You know, because there's 
we can always strive to achieve the next, the next level. And, you know, having that aha moment every day is great. And also asking the opinion of the professionals that are fixing my shit. Because I, I don't want my stuff to have to be fixed when it goes out. So, like, what can I do better? I think communication and collaboration is great. I mean, some of the, the best results will come when you're working with someone you're familiar with and you're comfortable enough to be, like, really open. Like, tell me, like you said, like, tell me what I could do better. Uh, there's some engineers that they they approach it differently. It's not coming from a place of collaboration. It's coming from a place of I think it should sound like this. You get yes, absolutely confrontation. So it's not like a we're working together. I'm here to enhance this. It's like you made it sound this way. I think it should sound this way, and um, that is never going to result in a, a fantastic sounding project. It'll sound it could sound great, um, but it's just not. I mean, man, it's, it's great to work with people that you like, that are talented, and that are everyone is looking out for the best interest of the project and not themselves. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when, when collaboration making me think of tracking, you guys experience this, I know, is when you're in a room with five, six other musicians, and, and if you're engineering and with a producer and an artist that really is creative, you, it's, it's like building blocks. You do something that inspires someone else, a guitar player. They, they tweak and do something, and all of a sudden this, and there's this inspiration that goes back and forth, and it just takes it up and up and up. And you can't, you can't get it any other way because it's that interaction and those personalities coming together that makes that product. I actually like to think that's the real job of a tracking engineer. I mean, everybody thinks the job of the tracking engineer is to get the best sounds, but I don't think it is. The, the job of the tracking engineer is to get the best performance by inspiring the musicians with sounds which may not actually be the best sounds. Drummers play different when you run their drums through like a Moog filter and a distortion pedal and you pump that into their headphones. And all of a sudden they're playing something really cool that everybody else starts reacting to. So it's almost, I think it's almost better to get kind of screwed up sounds and get an amazing performance than to worry about making everything pristine and everyone is so bored they go to sleep. Yeah, but it's a reactive environment. Right. That's, that's, that's the cool thing. On the best sessions. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's part of producing, too. It's like you've hired, I mean, you know, in Nashville we have the greatest session players on the planet, and you hire these people to come in, and if you're telling them what to play, you're undermining Crazy. their abilities to come up with something cool. It's like the reason you hire, you know, Jerry Rowe is because he plays in a certain style. And you give him the sound that's cool and inspiring. You put a delay on there or whatever. He's going to do the thing. But if you tell him, play boom bop, boom bop, it's like, just go get somebody who, you know, you don't, you don't need, you're wasting his time. Well, and he will play boom bap, boom bap, sure. and then he'll stop throwing out he'll suggestions stop, yeah. for the rest of the yes, session because exactly. he knows you don't give a shit. Exactly. And with guitar players, if you're telling them, you know, playing exactly this, it, you know, when I'm producing, I'll be like, the song's falling down to me here. What can we do? And everybody sort of goes and they're like, okay, what can we do there? And hopefully not everybody fills at the same time, but they come up with some new idea that helps lift the song in the place that for me is falling down and getting boring. No, that's it. it it's, it's allowing, it's, it's sort of mentoring that, that creativity through the session, because if you go off first and just suggest, you're, you're, you're really tying their hands. And I've been in both, and it, it's good. You which know? One's, and then, which one's then, more fun? Well, all <laughs> <laughs> well, okay with me. It's the musicians that get driven nuts, you know? But, but yeah, that's it. That's it. Marvelous. So, location. You've been here for a quite some period of time now. Twenty five years, twenty four years. So you've watched it change quite dramatically. Yeah, I should have bought a lot more real estate in Berry Hill. <laughs> it has tra changed dramatically, and it's been it's been amazing. I mean, I I love coming here. I've, some of Nam, I've been here four years in a row now. It's like it's a great excuse to just come out and hang. Yeah. So. How long have you been here now, Ryan? Three and a half years. Oh, wow. It feels like forever and yesterday at the same time. <laughs> but the same thing happened in L.A., 16 years in L.A., and every day I drove home for the first three years, I'm like, I fucking live in L.A. It's amazing. Palm trees. Yeah, but it's, it's been wonderful. And I sat on this stage three years ago when I first got here, and I say the same thing. It's like the, the, the culture is very embracing. The people in this neighborhood are wonderful, and people stop by and say hello, and... Anything you could possibly want, whether it's booze or gear or advice or real estate agents, 
they're here and your friends know everybody. It's, it's great. What was the transition like? Uh, it, was, it was great because I landed in a place where I had a group of friends. I knew Jeff already. I knew Reed. I knew Vance. You know, there's tons and tons of people that I already knew. And I've met threefold that number since. And um, I didn't come here to make country music, but I'm doing country records and, and folk records and Americana stuff like I did in L.A. Um, but occasionally someone who lives down the street will call me to work and otherwise they're coming in from L.A. or Europe or New York or whatever uh, or not coming at all and I just mix over the ethernet, uh, over the ether rather, um, and do whatever's necessary. So it's, it's just a, it's a great community, it's a great creative place and yeah, couldn't be happier. Do you think more or less work or just the same being in the lo either location? I've been busier here than L.A. but I don't know that that's due to the location. I think it's just due to the career tra trajectory. You know, it's like yeah. I can I can mix faster. I'm trying to catch up to a CLA 10. Yeah, well, you got the RH 10 out coming out. Yeah, soon, yeah, so we'll that's okay. yeah. We got my signature series coming yeah. out. <laughs> and Jeff, how long have you been here? Uh, 1991. So a while, a little longer than it's you. BC or AD? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, funny. I was in college, though, so, you know. Wow. W where did you come from, Jeff? I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet. Uh, I, I grew up in Illinois, southern Illinois. Where, sorry? Southern Illinois. Beautiful. Yeah. And did you already have a pretty great career there? Were you already oh, traveling no, no, around? Oh, no, I came down to Belmont. Oh, you came so to So I went to school. Belmont before that and then moved to L.A. and then moved back in 91. And in L.A., did you have a... Pretty great career there. Yeah, yeah, I was busy. I was out there about five years. Did a lot of pop, a lot of R and B. So when you moved out here, actually, you moved out outside of the. I'm going to use this word. Sorry, outside of the Exodus. Yeah, well, you know, the <laughs> Exodus was just starting. Oh, it was. Yeah, it was. There, there. Paul Lyme. A few people were moving here from L. A. And uh, so it, I think it was just starting to trickle. It was the trickle of the Exodus. Yeah, it was the trickle. For you, Kim, mastering. I mean. Do you kind of like being in Jersey, so not everybody's going to show up on your doorstep? Yeah, I kind of like it. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, the luxury of modern mastering is that you can do it anywhere. People don't attend as much as they used to. Um, you used to have to actually bring your analog tape to your mastering session, which is one of the reasons why. Uh, and also, it's it can be a cool experience, uh, a really well-treated mastering room, listening to your, you know, your project being mastered. It's, it's cool, but... 98% uh, of the stuff that I work on is through the internet. It's just get, get done way faster. Um, I'm a huge believer that you're going to make better decisions listening in your own environment anyways. I mean, you're going to come to my room and it's going to sound great. And there's going to be stuff that you might miss that you'll hear when you get home and you might then think of like wanting a change. But I think that everybody should be listening where they're most comfortable. You'll make the, be the best decision that way. iPhone speakers? Definitely. <laughs> Earbuds. No. Um, uh, if that's what it is, then yeah. Um, but Jersey is great. It's Jersey's great. Uh, no, I love I love where I live. I love that my studio is attached to my house. I love that I'm close enough I can get to New York City. I'd really like to see more of uh, I don't know engineering and music environment there. It's really leaving and dissipating to the point where I mean. It's one of the things that I love about Nashville when I visit is that there's such a rich community of musicians and engineers and it's, it's, it's very alluring. Um, but I hope to see that, that kind of come back to the New York metro area. I mean, me too. I was talking about this with Ryan yesterday. I've had a couple of great conversations with his father because I, I'm blessed to work with Jack Douglas on a lot of projects. And when I was a kid, I would look at the back of albums, and they were either recorded at Sunset Sound in Los Angeles, or they were all recorded at Power Station, the record plant. I mean, my age group is all about New York music of the 70s. You know, all punk and new wave was us just trying to be New York in the 70s. As Mike Bloomfield said, uh, the British took American music and sold it back to the Americans, you know. <laughs> it's very true. Um, so yeah, I. I hope for that. I mean, it's a little esoteric conversation to go off on, but yeah, I really do hope there can be a New York music scene because it was, it was world beating. I mean, amazing engineers, amazing producers, incredible artists. 
that would be so good, but I don't know. It's in Brooklyn now. Yeah. It's in Brooklyn? I mean, I think, it, I think it's all there, but I think that there's not a cohesiveness like there is here in Nashville. So it's kind of like finding a way to connect all the, the dots of where the studios are now, where the musicians are now, where, where do you go to see a good show uh, that, that's not like going to... I mean, it's economics, isn't it? It's as simple as that. I mean, when I was a kid, you could go on the doll, and it was crap, but the government would pay most of your rent, and you were in a band. And that's how most northern English bands started, which would include the Smiths and Joy Division and all of the, this great stuff. They were all unemployed, living in probably a bed sit, four of them, playing in a band. I mean, that's just not a, an option now for a city like New York. And of course, there's an obvious thing. Nashville is a heck of a lot more affordable. So, so I suppose it doesn't matter. If the musicians come here and they make great music, that's just as good as them doing it. But it is a shame that that New York sensibility that we all grew up loving is you know, not necessarily re reinforced. Are we good, Chevy, on time? Keep going? Whatever. Oh, wow. 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 That's a rather good idea. She, Chevy's a lot smarter than me. Questions from the audience? Do you want to shout it out loudly? I got two. They're closely related, though. Yes. So, based on kind of what I heard from you guys, number one, do you want to be involved in maybe pre production stage? And right. number two, uh, what do you feel about taking your click and doing a lot of edits, ramping it up, changing it here and there, and so forth? I mean, I'd, I've tempo mapped a thousand times. I'm sure you guys have all tempo mapped. Yes and yes. I, if I'm producing a band, we have to have pre-production because otherwise you don't know what the fuck they have. And I will not walk into a studio, A, not knowing if the band can play and B, not knowing if they have any songs. And yeah, tempo maps are great, especially if you have a band that, that can't play, you know, consistently at all. So yeah, I've used all those things and they're both very excellent. You know, for me, it, it actually goes one step before that. I, I like to be involved from the songwriting stage because a lot of the precedent that you set in how a song's crafted influences the production and can hamper it if something's not where you're hearing where it ought to go. So I think it's great to be, there's, there's a whole another, another level of being able to do edits that you couldn't do. So I like, I like to go back to that step. What was your question? You know, I had that conversation. Everybody's had that conversation. <laughs> I remember having that conversation with Ted Jensen. Um, and hit, hit, huh? <laughs> oh no! I, I, in fact, I, I went and mastered a record right after the uh, the Death Magnetic thing went through Sterling, and I got to hear the mixes before and after. And sometimes there's not a lot you can do. Yeah. Um, you know, so be careful where you point fingers. But the, uh, uh, you know what he said? He's like, y you know when the wa volume war started? Jukeboxes. Yeah. With 45s, because everybody wanted their song to be a little bit louder than the last song. So basically, they started at the beginning of recorded music, and they will continue until the end of recorded music, because we're humans, and if you go to a speaker store... And they're trying to sell you speakers. The speakers they're trying to sell you will be 0.5 dB louder than the other ones. And that's because the way our ears work says that those are better, it's louder. Those are better, it's brighter. And that's just, that's just it's the human thing. It's the same thing as when, if you make $500 mixing a song, that becomes like your baseline. And then the first time you make 1,000, you don't want to take 500. And the first time you make 2,000, you don't want to take 1,000. That's just the way people work. And that's the way the volume wars work. Like, you will never be able to explain to the drummer of a rock band why the rough mix that they basically put through a distortion pedal <laughs> is more exciting than the final mix. 
That's just the way it is. So you accept it. You do as good as you can. Occasionally, you get an artist that gets it, and you get to get away with it. And occasionally, you get an artist that doesn't, and it's their record, and they have to listen to it for the rest of their life, and I have to listen to it for a week and a half. So more power to you. It's your record. You know, there, there, there are some efforts, though, moving forward with Spotify, trying to level volume out. And I've, I've met with uh, some of the audio staff at a major label this year. And they're, they, because they had memos. Yeah, they do, actually. They, they, they do different versions for everybody. Um, anyway, they're, they're, from the top down, there's been memos going, here's, here's what a waveform looks like when it's clipped. Here's what it's, and we're trying to move basically towards, you know, better audio. So it's it's out there. It's it's just looks slow like. going. Looks, looks like. like. Well, that's yeah. That's a, where my big eye roll comes in. It looks like this, but you know, we we, we focus so much on how s loud something is, but uh, and we, we do our best to make sure it sounds as good as it can on a various on various playback systems. But what are those playback systems? Earbuds, computer speakers, you know. So we go to these lengths to make sure that things aren't too loud or over compressed or distorted, but people don't care and we care for them because but your question of you know when when are these volume wars and, and uh, when the people that are paying the bill stop asking for it to be loud because i mean i i've never been asked to do something that i refuse to do to the point where i would not finish the project because i think that's insane well and understand also that artists are driven emotionally so they're listening to this whatever you're doing or whatever we're doing or whatever and they're they're reacting to it emotionally and if they're not feeling it they're going to turn it up because it gets more exciting mm -hmm. you know it's not something where you're going to sit down and have a technical conversation it's like okay well we're measuring this on a zero dbfs scale and you know they don't care it's, does it feel good or does it not feel good? Yeah. And uh, honestly, as a mixer, sometimes when you get tracks that suck, the only way to make them feel good is to obliterate them. I always worry when I see a guy like me talking about this, <coughs> you know, the over 40, should we say, politely, um, because I grew up listening to cassettes and AM radios with one speaker. And my dad gave me his AM player that had one, one earbud, and you'd listen in mono. So when I hear a guy like me talking about this audiophile stuff, I, it's, it's ridiculous. Because no matter how bad we want to pretend MP3s are, they're still 10,000 times better than what I grew up listening to. Well, didn't Richard Dodd just say that yeah. the other day in your thing? He was saying, yeah. you know, when the Beatles, when Sgt. Pepper's came out, I listened to it in my bedroom on a transistor radio under my pillow so my mother wouldn't hear it. And it was mind-altering. And he's like, I would have given anything to have an MP3 of that in headphones, in earbuds. Exactly. So we have, to be, we have to be careful because we're in a blessed time now where the worst listening environment is a thousand times better than it was, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, I had one friend whose dad had like these huge speakers, you know, the big 70s hi-fi, and we'd go over there to listen to the wall at maximum volume. But other than that, the wall was on a cassette player that was going... And I was still very, very happy to listen to it. So I think we're in a blessed time for that. And... I agree with the loudness war stuff, but going back to the first thing you said, and I'm sure Kim will echo this as a mastering engineer, 99.999% of the problems got nothing to do with the mastering engineer. It's because when people give me their rough mix, it's blob, finish. And I've got to compete with that. I get rough mixes that are between 4 and 6 dB louder than the finished masters will be. And then you have to explain again to the bass player why your mix isn't as exciting or you have to obliterate your mix and then you know it gets kicked on quality control like there's no there's no competing with that and you literally can't make something good louder than something distorted and we face that all the time because a lot of people who are making music are making it with 16 plugins on their master bus that they don't know how to use <laughs> what are you going to do and there is Plug-in manufacturers are all fighting each other to create that perfect multi-band compressor, limiter, blah, 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 anyway. So it's, it gets a little self-serving for that as well, um, unfortunately. As much as I love a lot of these plugins for the potential they have to help us in mixing in general, they also become a bit of the enemy as well. When I see this, you know, oh, there's this new function where the dynamic EQ switches and finds the frequency that may not be loud enough, and, you know, it's like... I get it. 
you know, I want things to be easier for all of us, but at the same time, um, like going back to what we started talking about, if we're going to grow as engineers, producers, mixers, songwriters, you know, not having everything that's fixed by a particular plugin actually isn't a bad thing because it teach, we can learn what those issues might be. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Want it in, oh, or is like a DAW or something like that that you guys need it to be in the format wise, as far as like uh, Pro Tools or whatever else is out there? I mean, you said there was no standard, but is there an industry standard for that? Like, you want to start with this one, Reed? Nah, but I, <laughs> if you're working in Pro Tools, I, you know what I tell people? I was like, I, I was like. If you're working in Pro Tools, send me your Pro Tools session. If you have plugins on there that you feel are absolutely like what you want, and that's the sound that you want to hear, print them. And it's really easy now. You select all the tracks and you commit them, and you know, boom, done. Like that's fine. I my the first thing my assistant does is go in and strips out all all the automation, all the plugins, all of that stuff. So, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of a, a bass backwards way of doing stuff it's like while you're working on the track if you've got a sound that's really working with the track print it you know the last thing that any mix engineer wants is hey i'd like you to make the decision i cut 16 tracks of guitar and like you pick the one you like just like the worst thing the mastering engineer wants is like i mix this whole song and then i took all of my two bus processing off and i'm going to send it to you because i know you have better two bus processing than i do like those are two rookie mistakes that screws everybody in the process especially the artist I want to quickly interject. Everything he said is completely correct for a really good mixer like yourself. I, as a producer, engineer, and I know everybody's going to, you understand, I've sent to some of, a handful of some of the most well-known mixers, and they want me to leave everything exactly as it is so they can recall it and go, oh, yeah, finished. I like that approach because to me that feels like that's somebody who's getting stuck into the song and is going to take a day on my song. And if they are charging me several thousand dollars, I'm actually feeling like, wow, this guy deserves, <laughs> did some work. But there's an increasing trend. And maybe it's predominantly pop and maybe R&B. I don't work in R&B or hip hop. But definitely in pop music, whenever I've done pop productions, they just want me to send the session exactly is as it is. Um, I don't mind that, but I just did a session where I got all these plugins that are betas, esoteric, wrapped, like all this wild stuff that there's no possible way. I'm, I have most of the major stuff, but there's no possible way I'm going to have these. So if they're integral to the sound, you got to print it because I don't have you know, XBQY beta three of the Smash Riser Graphometric Paralyzer that you just downloaded from like, you know, like LimeWire. But you do have the whatever. RS-10. Right, I do have the, I have the FRS-11. Yeah, FRS-11, okay. Um, but you know what I'm saying? Like, 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 if you're using crazy stuff, print it. You know, if, if the auto pan in the chorus of that guitar is like part of the song, Print it, or at least write me a note saying, "Yo, uh, this auto pan is like I spent 16 hours panning this thing. Like I want it to, I want it to go back and forth like that." Cool. I think ultimately, and I'm sorry, I'm passing on to these guys. We're playing to win. You know, we want you to be really happy. We want the artist to be ultimately happy. One of the biggest things I I I've found, and I probably were guilty on this, especially up and coming, is people get a little confrontational, especially if they're the engineer and they've just spent six months making the record, and then maybe they're making good money, a couple of grand a week, three grand, four grand a week, and then some famous shamus guy wants back in like 20 years ago seventy five thousand dollars to mix your record in ten days. You're like, Ugh. and you're like, you want the guy to work. I remember those feelings. I'm not saying that uh, anybody else would have had those feelings. But ultimately, you want your work to be amazing. You want, if you have spent six months engineering a record and somebody else is going to mix it, play to win. Tell them why you put that on there. Insist that they use it or listen to it or print it like, like Reed is saying so that you have the sound. Maybe give them both. Maybe give them the printed one and go, here's the sound I want and here's the DI I used to create. Well, Pro Tools, commit and you check the little box that says hide and make an active and then you get the printed one and you get the original underneath with all the plugins on it. Sweet. 
I, I ask for both, and then if they have massive background vocals, I'd like submit. Give me your balance. If you like your balance, submix it. Give me the constituent tracks, but just submix it. You're making my job easier. And if you've already got a balance you like, great. And don't send me a guitar part that has 17 microphones on it all over the room. Bounce those down. Like, tell me what is your sound. If you want to give me those for me to pick them, I'm gonna f I'm gonna pick my favorite mic and throw the rest away because that's ridiculous. You know, when I record, I bust things down, and, and this, is, this is my sound. Strings. Like, you know, like yeah. 100 strings. mics on strings yeah. and rooms. It's like, ah, Stacked what was TVs. your vision? What was yeah. the sound? How were they blended? Jeff, sometimes. <laughs> Jeff, I'm standing Hey, I'm in. <laughs> You're in. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Hey, I was wondering what you guys' opinion is on reference mixing. So, like, when you mix, do you rely more on your intuition, or do you like to listen to other people's stuff? I listen all the time. So why wouldn't I? There's a lot of guys that are better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I think it's, um, you know why they give you ginger at a sushi restaurant, really? It's not because people like to eat ginger. What you're supposed to do is when you switch from one bite of sushi to a different bite of sushi you're supposed to take that and it cleanses your palate so you get the full flavor of it that's what reference mixes do for me if i'm working on something for two hours and concentrating if i can switch to something else especially if i know that the artist is like this is the vibe we were going for it can reset just the way you're hearing stuff it just gives you a different perspective just like getting up and going for a five minute walk around the property or taking a phone call or taking an ear break or listening to a record that you really know or just you know something to just kind of force a perspective perspective because we can all disappear up our own butts sitting in front you know in between two speakers working for hours and hours so i think it's beneficial kim how's that in mastering that is uh exactly what reed said it's just per it's perspective is everything so it's not necessarily that you're trying to match something you're just trying to get a kind of a line to the outside world to what else is happening um and it's just whether it's a, a something that you're referencing or just an ear break uh it can go a long way to help you keep focus on what you're working on instead of just kind of getting too close and not being able to hear what you need to hear to finish the project. Yeah, now the real trick with that is not letting that be your driving force from the beginning because you're going to end up chasing something that may go away from the song. I, 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 li I mean, if I'm going to do that, I like to get the song together, get it, get it where I feel like I've got a vibe, something going. And then, then you can take an ear break and go back and forth. But if, you're, if you chase something from the beginning, I find that it just takes me into the forest, the dark forest somewhere. I'll be contrary and say that if I'm feeling good about things, I don't listen to anything else. I may start the day like just pottering around, checking emails and listening to music in the background, but once I start a song, I don't really go and listen to something unless I'm feeling like, I don't really know what's happening here. But I do ear breaks all the time. I'll take the dog for a walk or mm -hmm. take a phone call or you know have a, have a meal break or something do like that. Do you listen That's to rough crucial. mixes? I listen to, yeah, I listen to the rough mixes. I listen probably once at the beginning, and then as, I'm, as I feel really good about where my balance is and my automation, I'll listen to it again and make sure I crushed it. A uh, really interesting thing that is happening in mastering is that a lot of times mix engineers will make faux masters, so they'll send you the mixes as well as Guilty. the faux masters that the client's been listening to, which most of the time is really, really helpful um, okay. because it gives, you, it gives you perspective on what the client's been listening to and kind of what they've signed off on, and it, and it gives you that kind of frame of reference for where to take it. Sometimes it becomes problematic because the client is used to listening to that, that any change can be really difficult for them to take. Uh, a change like my master being quieter than their, the, the reference that they've been listening to. Um, and that is typically a hard sell, but sometimes there's a reason why and you can, you can get them to be okay with it. Sometimes it's just, there's no getting around it. You gotta keep it the same level or make it louder. Yeah, well, a lot of the time for mixing, um, we're competing against other mixers. Mm -hmm. So we're crushing it a little heavier than we would, <laughs> to say the least, just to make sure it jumps out of the speakers. Mm -hmm. and the only time I ever lost a mix was when I didn't send a loud mix to the client, and that was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So from, I, don't, I don't make it louder than all hell, but I add you know, a little Pro L2 to mine and make right. it competitive as you, you know quote unquote and yeah and I always send like the mp3 that the client has approved always goes with my mastering um, files and I'll send like there was an occasion recently where for whatever reason actually the sound of the mp3 conversion in Pro Tools they liked that 
and I had to figure out a way to get that sound and not give them an MP3 to go to mastering with. And it was really kind of weird, but they liked whatever it did. It made it grainy or stupid. I don't know. Any other questions? Are we good? Oh. Hi, appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Back in the day when uh, I started, we only had cassette machines. And so you made a comment about performance. So we'd run around in a room and set the mics up and play an intro and a partial verse to see if it kind of picked up everybody. And then we would do our performance being a cassette machine, which was like maybe a stereo to four track. And uh, we worked at that point, uh, but we didn't use click tracks. So we ended up five or six performances of the same song and kind of sit around, drink a beer, and decide which one was the better performance. But I kind of tend to find out if I use a shaker, it kind of gives you that, that cool groove and stuff like click, which is kind of hard, hardcore sometimes. Do you ever find that musicians respond well to a, a hand instrument oh. like that or... Oh, no, absolutely. I think an ice pick to the head for, like, a full day of drum tracking must be absolute. Yeah, yeah. yeah but using a loop as a click is awesome. It works great. Right. You know, and it's, yeah, it's easier to play, too, and it's, it can be a little groovier, and maybe it sometimes winds up as part of the track in the end. Was, didn't um, George Martin... Was, yeah, George Martin said that Ringo would... They would play the click track, or a metronome, I suppose, a click track. They would play a metronome, and Ringo would play a tambourine to the metronome and then they were cut to the live tampering performance to the metronome. Thank you. Whatever works. I mean, sometimes it's fun to send a click or a loop or whatever to the drummer and not send it to anybody else on the session and they're going to follow the drummer. Yeah, I, I find it depends on uh, especially the drummer. And I mean, the guys that you can say, okay, play your cymbals a little softer, play your hi-hat a little louder or softer. I mean, those guys that can actually do that stuff and feel good and, and get a great performance also have something they love to play to and it depends sometimes on the song and what the groove is and sometimes maybe you know maybe a woodblock quarter note is what they want to have the room to go in between stuff and put their feel in there and sometimes maybe it is a shaker or a, or a loop that that lets them find their way so a lot of it varies yeah there's so many variations and there's you know as you know there's different tricks i remember working uh try and remember the producer but anyway he made me mess with the drummer. Like basically the drummer was ahead or behind the click. So the next take without telling, I'm sure you've had it done a thousand times, done it a thousand times. Without telling the drummer, I changed the tempo by a couple of beats. So now suddenly he's like, oh, he's like locking in. It's the tempo that, you know, that he's not playing. And then I go back that next take and he's locking. So there's lo in that world of clicks and loops and shakers, there's lots of different things. But I think as Jeff is saying, it's, it's really up to the drummer. Some guys love marimba too, that ding, 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 which is like the most painful one. They would say, give me marimba too. Other guys are like, I need the Yuri click. And then I, I know, um, depends on the track, but I know Victor and Drizzo sometimes likes a little out of time delay. Just so it, you know, you don't feel like you've got the freaking execution and like Tell me you have to do it right you know so yeah it's definitely a drummer dependent thing and so it's good to know a thousand different tricks but more to Jeff's point listen to your musicians because they're going to tell you what they need you know there's nothing worse than being the guy or girl that's like no this is the way it works best because that's not that's not going to create a good environment any other questions I think we're good we're good awesome hey Thank you, Jeff, Ryan, Kim, Reed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for great questions. <laughs>